If y'all will let me, just let me pitch the book I'm writing for just a minute, which is where all these positions have come from. I'm calling it The Best I Saw in Chess, and it's not done yet, but on my computer, it's about 500 pages. There are 37 chapters in it. It's all examples from my career, but it's really about the game of chess. Yeah, I, th I think it covers almost every aspect of the game. Nothing can be covered comprehensively in one book, but everything is sampled. Here's how the 37 chapters break down. 20 of them are my 20 favorite games I played. Counting down for game 20 against John uh, Fedorowicz to game one against Sergei Kudrin. And then the other 17 chapters, I call them snippet chapters because they're little game segments uh, uh, centered around different themes. There's four in-game chapters, there's three chapters on tactics. A lot of the stuff we're seeing comes from one or the other, the tactics chapters. There's a chapter on, on blunders, a chapter on fortresses, uh, a chapter on, on middle games, which I call pressing an edge. There's a chapter on cheating, it's an honest chapter. Embarrassingly short games is another chapter, games that are 20 moves that someone won. I put all of my losses in that one. Uh, compositions and whimsy, five stories in their positions. Okay, just a great variety of stuff in the book, which is all possible because I, I kept 1,009 out of 1,011 of my score sheets from when I was a player. It's, it, it covers all aspects of chess, and it, if, if Magnus Carlsen is watching this, if you read my book, Magnus, you'd probably have to retire. That would just like be the end. All right. Okay, I'm going I'm to make a confession on this next one. This, this next position here, this one here, can you all see this? Maybe I'll flip this a bit. Now, you know that I'm black in this position because white's pawn is still on E2. I, n I never play with white, and that pawn stays there more than one move. This is from a chapter of the book called The Closest I Came to Cheating. And... Yeah, this is pretty close, all right. I would say that this, is, this was my worst moment as a competitor. This was the most unethical thing I did, and I, I don't want to excuse it, but I'll just tell you the story and tell you what happened. I was 13 years old. Again, I had the black pieces. Now, my opponent, incidentally, a man named Alan Yeoman, seemed like a nice guy, but I didn't know him. My opponent had no arms. My opponent had lost both of his arms in an industrial accident in 1974, but he needed no help playing. He moved by picking the pieces up between his teeth, and then when, uh, to hit the clock, he used, uh, I guess, the nub, a kind of stub of, of where his arm had been, and then his penmanship was beautiful. He picked up a pencil between his teeth and wrote with his teeth, and his handwriting, his teeth writing, it looked great. Okay. and. Now, and uh, Alan Yeomans as white had played a very solid game. So this is the position, equal material, rather symmetrical. Uh, you'd have to say white has a small advantage here, just because white's pieces are a bit more aggressively posted. Otherwise, everything is equal. Now, I was not happy about having this equal position as black against a player 400 points lower than me. But what really bothered me was not just that I was equal or a little worse, what bothered me was white has no weaknesses here. I really did not understand how I could create any winning chances. So what I did was, first of all, I played what I think is the best move, bishop c6. Okay, white's bishop on e4 is better than black's bishop over here on the side, a4. So I endeavored to swap these pieces, strategically correct decision. But then what I did was, after I played the move, I got up from the board, as I always did, and I did a double take on the position, and I stormed out of the room as if I was very upset by what I had just done. Okay, this is completely illegal to uh, try to trick your opponent like this. But I left the room, and when I came back in, my opponent had resigned. He, uh, he could have called the tournament director, but he was a, a southern gentleman, and I, I walked back in and he just said, I fell for it. And he resigned. And what had happened was he had played the move queen takes c5 as I had wanted him to. And he resigned because black wins like this. Bishop takes bishop. Taking a free piece. 
And after black's queen is gone, black gives check on b1 with his rook. White can throw his rook in the way and lose the rook, but he's just delaying the checkmate by one move. King h2 and rook h1 mate. So it, it, it is what it is, folks. It is what it is. Uh, I cheated against a man with no arms <laughs> <laughs> and compelled his resignation from an equal position without playing another move. All right. Let's go from my worst moment to my best here. What I want to show you, I want to show you the combination of this game. And uh, first of all, I, I have to warn you, this will not have a very satisfying conclusion because once I played the combination, the game then continued, but there's way too much game for me to show it to you in lecture on combinations. Okay, having said that, I'm, I'm gonna try not to talk too much about this game because I am so freaking proud of this game. I will sound very conceited if I talk about it. But this is a game I played when I was 11 years, six months old. And in this game, I performed the best, single best calculation that I ever performed as a chess player. And I have no idea how I did this at age 11. In, in my book, this is game number two, my second favorite game of all time. So I, I want to show you this calculation that I performed. And maybe you'll like the combination, even if, even if it doesn't end the game. So the player with white is my, my oldest friend in the world, my friend of 35 years, Kyle Farrell. I love this guy. We played lots of great games. Okay, let me go quickly through these moves. Again, I had the black pieces. We have a C3 Sicilian. And Kyle and I, we knew this line, and so we played a lot of moves pretty quickly. D4, pawn takes pawn. Queen takes pawn, it's probably a little inferior, but it's a normal book line, at least it was back in the Stone Ages. Knight C6, queen goes to E4, black plays D6. Knight BD2, I played pawn takes pawn. Knight takes pawn, this is all theory, kind of boring theory. Knight scoots back to F6, attacking white's queen. White pins the black knight on, e4, on C6. I played queen C7, uh, knight DF3, defending the knight on E5. Let's develop a piece, why don't we? Bishop d6. Knight takes bishop, oh, sorry, knight takes knight on c6. Now I love playing cute moves, so I just play bishop d7, I'll win the piece back this way. I think I didn't like having doubled pawns when I was 11. I play bishop takes knight. Uh, white develops, bishop b5. Okay, now I played knight d5. Now white plays knight d4. Okay. Uh, crisis has arisen early in this game. All right, we're at a book at this point. Okay, it's black's move. Now white has three pieces bearing down on the c6 square. Black has two defenders. It is surprisingly difficult, I think, for black not to lose a pawn here immediately. Let me just run a, run a few of the ways to lose a pawn here. 97. Defending the bishop, this is no good. White's going to remove the defender. Bishop takes knight. Even Bobby Fischer would give up his bishop for a knight in this position. Jadub, bishop takes knight. And when black recaptures, now white again has too many things on the black bishop. Oh, if black wants to lose more than a pawn, he would play the move bishop takes bishop here. White plays knight takes bishop. This is an immediate win for white. Black's queen is attacked. And with this discovered check coming on black's king, knight takes bishop, double check. White's going to win a piece, something big right away here. Black can't do that. Okay, how can we defend this square? Okay, king d7, just don't make me laugh. You can't play your king to d7. Okay, if, if rook c8, that's a normal looking move, but it just, it just drops this pawn on a7. The pawn is undefended. Uh, finally, okay, again, retreats are hard to see. This would be a move that would stop the immediate problems. But after this move, let's say that white just at, ratchets up the pressure on the d-file like this. Black has got problems here. Black is not ready to castle here. And uh, OK. So all this makes this quite a crucial position. And it was in this position 
that I made the best calculation of my career. So that there's going to come a point in this game where I'm going to say, remember that earlier position? I saw all this from that position. So this is the position you should remember right here. Uh, not seeing a good way to defend myself on c6, I, I made a gambit of it and castled. OK. Now Kyle could do something boring here and bail out, start taking things and retreating things. But I had played a lot of garbage against this guy in the past, and he thought this is more garbage. And I'm glad that he went in for what I regard as the main line. So he, he wins a pawn here with knight takes bishop. I'll just mention bishop takes bishop here would not win a pawn for white, because black would not take the bishop, and white's queen takes the pawn. But black can retreat his knight, attacking white's queen. The queen must move. It's too important a piece to leave it hanging. Let's say we play queen b5. Now black attacks it again. Uh, very smooth here. Now the white queen has got nowhere to retreat to, to move to, where it's still going to be on this piece. I mean, maybe white will play this. This looks pretty normal. Black plays pawn, takes bishop. Black has not lost a pawn here. It's a comfortable position for black. So if Kyle's going to go in for a win of a piece, and Kyle was around 2,200 player, he did it the right way. He plays knight takes bishop. All right, knight takes bishop. I played, hold on, yeah, pawn takes knight. And he goes bishop takes pawn. Now what am I doing here? What am I going to do having lost a pawn? It's not the same move as before. If knight b6 here attacking the white queen, the white queen has got no problem maintaining the defense of the bishop with queen e4. Now, f5 by black is not going to be any good because white's going to take this pawn with check. And you know, black could uh, try to do something here. Rook c8, maybe, attacking the piece. White retreats. Now black could play queen c5, attacking two pieces, two white bishops along the fifth rank. But the problem is white can save them both by first playing bishop d3. Checkmate in one is threatened on h7. And black has to defend himself against the checkmate. And then white can simply save this piece. White's a pawn up. White has the two bishops. White's going to win the game. That was not the idea. So is black here, instead, Jadoub, instead of retreating my knight to b6, I played knight takes c3. Now, usually I like to sacrifice my opponent's pieces. But here, the position demanded I sacrifice my own. So Kyle takes, pawn takes knight, and now I just calmly play rook a c8. All right. This is a good position, folks. OK, black is a full piece down here. But white has a big tactical problem. White's bishop is now double attacked. If the bishop moves, then black's queen will be taking this pawn on c3 to check. Some kind of big attack is coming here. I'm, I'm very glad, again, that Kyle played the gutsy move, and he retreated his bishop. OK, first, let me just look at a couple other things here, aside from retreating the bishop. One point here is that white cannot bail out by castling, and then after queen takes bishop, uh, dining on this pawn on a7. Just the stars are aligning for black in this game, because the white queen is trapped. Bishop c5 attacking the queen. The queen has one and only one safe square to go to. a5, rook a8. See you later, queen. White loses. So this was not feasible for the white player. Now, with the full benefit of computer-aided hindsight, White's best move here is the exceedingly wimpy but correct bishop d2 <laughs> defending this pawn, forcing black jadoub, queen on a4. Where are you, Doug? <laughs> queen takes bishop. OK, this, is, this really would have taken the fun out of the game. Queen takes queen. Rook takes queen. And now, having played bishop d2, white's king is still in the center. That's where you want it in the end game. The king is a fighting piece in the center. Develop your king in the, in the end game. King e2. OK, equal material, probably a draw.
No, nah, it's no fun. That's no fun. I, it's hard to criticize White for any of the moves he made in this game. And this is one thing. My, my, this is my second favorite game. To play a really good game of chess, your, your opponent has to play well, too. Just crushing someone never makes for a great game. And it really has to be two good players playing two good games. OK, so, so White wants to hold on to his extra piece. And he played to the best square, if White's going to do that. Bishop f3. These are all specific tactics. Let me show you why bishop e4 would be a terrible move. It's because black would take check here with the queen, now attacking the king and the rook both. So white must move his king forward to connect the two rooks for the defense. And black has this move. Damn, Hoshvili. OK. Queen's attacked. Bishop's attacked. White's, uh, white's going down the drain here. The other square that I think is logical to consider here for white is bishop b5. And here's why Kyle rightly rejected this move. Queen takes pawn check. Again, the king must go forward to, so the rooks can protect one another. Black's queen checks down here. If you will, just take my word for it. If the white king goes forward, white gets in trouble. So white wants to bring his bishop back here and defend. Now black plays rook c2, attacking the good old b-hopper in d2. White defends that bishop, and now winning by pinning bishop b4 by black. And now the white bishop on d2 cannot be defended again by white's pieces. Black is winning back his piece on d2. White's king is exposed. Black has an extra pawn, at least for the moment. This is bad for white. Now, some similar moves were played after Kyle's choice of bishop f3. He goes bishop f3. OK, I, I checked, as we're familiar with. White goes king e2, as before. Check here, as before. And white plays bishop d2. OK, I play my rook down to attack his bishop. He wants to defend his bishop and also kind of save this piece here. So he plays rook 81. And once again, I pin his bishop with my bishop, bishop b4. So this is the same position we just had with the difference that's white's bishop, which was on b5, is now on f3. And with the bishop no longer on b5, white has this move, which he played, queen d7. OK, Kyle thought. Kyle saw this. He thought, this is what he wants to do. This is going to be good for white. Black is a full piece down here, a full piece down. And I'll, I'll just mention, if black plays this, it's, you usually look at checks. Check, king goes back to f1. There's no follow-up here for black. There's no follow-up. With the first position that we looked at, that rook and minor piece in game, I said that if all your pieces are contributing to your attack, see if you can throw in a pawn. But there's a prior principle, which is you want all your pieces to be contributing to your attack. And here, you see black has three very nice, aggressive pieces down here and a rook that's not doing nothing. And what looked so strong to Kyle about this defense is that the queen on d7, it's kind of crowding out the rook on f8. So black has one piece that is not contributing to the attack. Again, I was 11 years old. I'm so proud of this game. So here, OK, in my book, I, I, I show every, every good thing I did in chess. Everything that I could show, I showed in the book. And in the whole 500-page book, I only have two moves that I made that I, that I think deserve a double exclamation mark. And this was one of the two moves. Okay, I just I love this so much. I played this move. Bishop a5. Another retreat. A quiet move. Okay. The bishop moved to a5. It changes nothing in the position except it opens up the threat of rook d8 to bring black's last piece into the attack to bear another piece down on the square of d2. And white has surprisingly few options here. 
So now what I want to do is show you two things from this position. I want to show you what Kyle actually played, which was smart. And then I want to show you what I regarded as the main line in this position, which is this calculation that I'm so proud of. OK, let me, let me show you what Kyle did first. He, he counterattacked by attacking my rook. And so, OK, now I carried through with my plan. Rook d8, now defended by the bishop. And to eliminate all these threats, white now simplifies the position, gives up his queen. Queen takes rook check. Bishop takes queen. Bishop takes rook. Queen takes bishop. So this is the way combinations sometimes go, especially if the games, I think, are very nice games. It's a combination that does not lead to checkmate, that does not lead to the win of the queen. It leads to a much smaller advantage. So now we have a position, and this occurred in the game, where black has a queen and a pawn for two rooks. Basically even material distribution. But white is still exposed here. This pawn is hanging. White hasn't gotten his rooks out. The long and the short of it is black is probably winning one more pawn here. Tips the balance in black's favor. And so the game continued, and it was a lively queen versus two rooks position that happened. White played the move rook b1. And I'll stop here uh, on the game. Uh, but there's one thing. I had a sort of a silly thought about something. I'm going to share with you a silly thought. OK, one move I looked at here was rook c1. OK, so white wants to get his rooks out. Obviously, black wants to take this. And now it looks for a moment like this is danger for black. This is bad for black, because now white gets his rook to c8, attacking the bishop. The problem is. It's the, the scorpion sting at the tail end of the combination. Queen a6 check, forking, preventing this for white. Now here's the silly thought that I had about this whole thing. The silly thought was, if I had done all this, all this combination the same way, and my pawn had simply been on a6 rather than a7, nothing would be changed except my combination wouldn't work anymore. <laughs> Because now rook c1, I just cannot take this pawn. Rook c8 is too dangerous a move with this not threatened. I've got to do something else here. And I, I don't know how this comes out, but it's, it's no longer uh, very good for black. And so it's like almost this kind of philosophical question. Did, uh, <laughs> how do I put this? Was I lucky that my pawn was on a7? Or is it that I played very well? So of course my pawn is on a7. And I, I, I've decided after a lot of thought that I was lucky that the best game that you've ever played, or the second best game, is probably a game where you're not only smart and playing good moves, but where you also get lucky. And so I, I was lucky that I, I, I had this resource, potentially. OK, so that, not a satisfying ending in terms of the game, because we're now leaving the game. But I want to show you the variation that I calculated from this position. Je, yeah. You are correct, sir. You are correct, sir. OK. Jadub, put that back. Bishop a5, double exclaim, so I claim. I was thinking that the one way white might try to maintain his material advantage here is to break the pin with king e1. And now black should not be tempted by this, which might work in some different position. Rook takes bishop. Rook takes rook. Queen check here. Now this bishop that's not doing very much plays a critical role here. Now black's attack is done. Maybe it's still an interesting position, but now black's a piece down, and this is not what black wants. OK, rather, after king e1, breaking the pin, remember white is still a piece up in this position, black should of course, now continue with his plan, bishop a5, rook d8. And now, to try to maintain white's material advantage, white tries to play bishop takes bishop, rook takes queen, and rook takes rook. So now, white has two rook, uh, sorry, a rook and two bishops for the queen. That is a big material advantage. And white's threatening maiden one down here, and black cannot mate white's king. White has pieces to put on d1. White's bishops are kind of controlling squares. But, but, black has this move, check. 
hitting the king, hitting the bishop, a double attack. So white moves his king over to attack black's rook. Black now plays queen takes bishop, thank you very much. Now not only is black capturing a piece here, which is good, notice that black's queen is now defending against the mate. And then white plays king takes rook. And now, now look at this, queen a4 check. Whoops, check. King c3, doesn't matter. Queen takes rook. And black has a decisive material advantage of queen and pawn for rook and bishop. And now is the time when I ask you to remember that position. Okay, before black had castled, white played knight d4. He's got three pieces on c6. From that position, before I castled, I calculated this 15 move variation. Bishop a5 was the eighth move in the variation. And it's all accurate and it wins for black. And I never, I never saw anything this good after the age of 11. <laughs> so, so now let me, let me show some king side attacks. Good old fashioned king side attacks. Uh, maybe this is what you came here to see. Uh, okay, let's make this position happen. So I have the black pieces against my friend Jack Gwynn. Uh, white is a pawn down in this position. White's second move against the Sicilian was, was b4, the wing gambit. White is still a pawn down from that dubious decision. It's black to move, and so here we go. The first move is as natural as a baby's shrieking cry. Bishop takes h3. We all want to do this some point or another in our lives. Okay, let the attack begin. The first thing I have to show you is, of course, the move pawn takes bishop, which white wants to play. Queen takes pawn. White's problem here, look at these pieces over here. Everything is on the queen side for white. White has got no defenders to his king. White's knight is attacked. The knight really can't move because the bishop and the queen are set for a very uh, uh, crushing check here on h2. White can maybe protect his knight with his queen. Queen d1. Now black plays knight g4. And white just cannot do anything here. White has no pieces he can bring to the defense of his king. Black's threatening bishop h2 check with nasty consequences. And white's White's not in a position to do anything. Oh, oh, I should show you one other thing here after black plays queen takes h3, because there's kind of a, rec a recurrent variation in this game. If white plays bishop takes f6, I don't know quite why white would do that. Maybe he's trying to eliminate some potentially attacking black piece. Black not only wins here, black just mates by force, because black starts with check. White can come here, check, back. It's going to be the same thing. King f1. Now black plays queen takes f3, threatening checkmate in one move on h1. So white brings his king over to stop that. And now black checkmates white with nothing but checking moves. Just very forcing. Check. King f1. Check. These are only moves for white. King g1. Queen h2 check. King shuffles over to its demise. Queen h1 is mate now. OK. So white can't do that. Got that, folks? Excellent. Jack is a good tactician. So after I, I threw my bishop in to take the pawn on h3, white then plays bishop takes f6. How old was I? Oh, 16 years old. The Alabama State Championship. Important tournament, folks. Bishop takes f6. Now, white's hoping for this. This is a very bad move. Mechanical, very poor move. Pawn takes bishop. If I had done that, now white plays queen takes pawn. And the position is completely transformed now. White's king is no longer in any trouble. Uh, Black's king is open. White's threatening the bishop. White's threatening this pawn. I don't know what's happening here, but this is uh, really very bad for Black to take such a strong attack and to mess it up by playing pawn takes bishop. 
Now, a move Black might have played in this position. I did not play. A move Black might have played uh, a natural move, Queen G4, right? It's nice to threaten mate in one on G2. Uh, now, uh, the game is not over. White can play knight H4, defend against the mate. It's funny how that bishop on F6, which is attacked, which is doomed, is nevertheless serving a function here. It's defending the knight. Okay, I'm going to stop this variation here. To tell you the truth, black wins in this variation. But I'll show you the one that actually happened. All right. So black's taken a pawn, white's taken a knight. And, but I wasn't through with my bishop over here. I played bishop takes a pawn. Just more destruction of the white king position. Once again, this move... I'm angling for this, this recurrent variation I mentioned. If white plays king takes bishop, white's not just in trouble, white's mated. Queen check. King here, king here, it doesn't matter. Queen takes knight. Threatening mate on h1. Now white plays king g1, it's the same thing as before, exact same position. Check, 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 checkmate. The king cannot take the bishop on g2 and live to, to talk about it. All right. So white has a knight attacked. Maybe black will take this bishop at some point. Black's, really, black's biggest threat here is just queen h3. Black is just threatening checkmate. Queen h3, threatening queen h1 mate. White has no defense. Knight h2, queen takes knight as checkmate. The bishop covers the queen. The white king is surrounded and attacked. So white cannot play king takes bishop. White must stop, do something about this queen h3 threat. And so what Jack did was knight h2. Now white is threatening king takes bishop. I, I don't want to take this check. This is not a good idea. White's going to take the correct bishop here. He's going to play king takes bishop this way. And black has no win in that position. Now, a move that's very tempting is to play queen h3. Again, it's a very strong looking move. It threatens maiden one on h2. Now, however, Mr. Gwynn has, has got something here. He's got the move f4. So the move f4 cuts off black's bishop, and at the same time it opens up the second rank for white's queen. White's now threatening queen takes bishop. And if black plays check here, this bishop is once again triumphant, and it's uh, en prix square in f6, because white has now d4. White is hanging on by the skin of his teeth here, but white is a piece up, and black has things hanging here. So this is, I don't know, run it through your computer. Some kind of crazy position, I don't understand. So, what do I do here? I don't take this knight, I don't play queen h3. White's threatening my bishop. White's pawn may come forward in some variations to uh, add white's queen to the defense of white's king. So I make a third offering of the bishop, bishop f3. Blocking that pawn for the third time offering the bishop. And for the third time, white cannot take, knight takes bishop because of check, takes, check, 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 mate. Our old friend, bishop f3. All right. White is lost here. There's probably many ways to lose. I'll show you what happened here. White plays bishop h4, natural looking move. White finally rescues his bishop. He hopes to bring it back to the defense of his king. But now I simply went bishop takes knight check. King takes bishop and this rather effective move, queen g4. So now maiden one is threatened on g2. Mate is threatened, takes the bishop, queen h1 mate, and if here, now it's a mate on h1, queen check, king back. That's what they call mate. 
So white resigned after this queen g4 move. And the last thing I'll say about this particular position is uh, just like it made all the difference whether my pawn was an a6 or a7 in the previous game, it's suddenly very important that black's pawn is on a6 and not a7, because if this pawn had been on a7, then all this would just be a way for black to lose, because white would then have the defensive move queen g5, protecting the bishop, protecting the square, white's a piece up. But with a pawn on a6 covering the queen, no can do. All right. Let's see another king side attack. All right, I had the black pieces here against Miles Artiman. All right. What's happening in this position? It is equal material. Now, white has the two bishops here, but the two bishops are not important. Oh, Doug, where's my man? Where's my man? White is not a rook down, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Equal material. Uh, the most important features of the position are that white's king is opened up, and white has two poorly placed pieces. Bishop passive on e1, and this knight is looking irrelevant on a3. That's white's problem. Another problem that white has is the weakness of the e3 square. And black may, s variations will happen where black will get a knight or a queen or something in e3, and then it's going to be very hard for white to get out of that. Okay, those, those are white's problems. Now, on the other hand, it has to be said that black does not have a typical attacking formation here. Black is, all black's pieces are out. First of all, black's missing a bishop. He might like to have his light squared bishop here. Uh, the bishop he has, it, it has attacking potential, although I, you might say it's kind of a bad bishop with all these black pawns on the same color square as a bishop. Maybe that matters. Black's knights, they protect each other, but black doesn't really need his pieces to be protecting each other here. He might rather his knights be on squares that just uh, attack unoccupied squares. Okay, it's not a perfect attacking position for black, but nevertheless, white is going down here with accurate play. My first move here is black was, again, I love these retreating moves. This one's easier than the others. I played my queen back to h6. This has two purposes here. The first purpose, I'm just attacking a pawn on h3. White, white better do something about that. The other, the other uh, purpose of this move, queen h6, the queen is undefended on g5. And so therefore, with white's queen on this diagonal here, black cannot move this pawn in this position without losing his queen. Now on h6, the queen is defended by black's bishop on h6. So now, and white does not want to play pawn takes pawn, knight takes pawn. It's a very strong square for that knight. So now in every variation, every move that white considers, white must reckon with two possibilities with this black pawn. Pawn takes pawn or f3. And what we have here is a position in which white has got a wide variety of losing moves. There are a lot of ways to lose this for white. And let me, let me show you a few of them just to give you kind of a feel for the position. If white defends this pawn, let's say his queen goes to g2, now f3 is the crushing move for black. If white plays bishop takes pawn, the queen comes into e3 check. And that puts another piece on white's bishop on f3. White's losing a piece here. White's losing a bishop. White doesn't want this. And uh, if f3, if you can't take that pawn on f3, then you've just got a very sad position. Uh, I mean, your queen is going to go over here. Jadub, this queen is here. I don't know. Queen check. Maybe actually I'd play knight takes pawn first. Bishop takes knight, queen check. This is, this is not, not much fun for white. If white plays h4 in this position to defend the pawn, now black will make use of the fact that this g4 square is available for his knight. The knight's coming into e3. This line goes on, but maybe you can take my word for it. Knight g4, threatening knight e3. Bad news for the white bits. Let's see. What else might we try? King g2. 
Okay, I'll let this I'll let this be the last variation aside from what happened. King g2 is a very normal move. Not King h2, now this would allow knight g4 check. That is a very bad thing to happen to white. But if King g2, now black again has a very forcing win with f3 check. White, I guess, will take this pawn. If he moves his king, he'd have to move it here to keep a defense of this pawn. But now knight g4 check. We'll take the king away from the defense of that pawn. Queen takes pawn. This is disaster for black, for white. But let's look at the main line. F3 check. Bishop takes F3. This is simplicity itself here, folks. Queen takes queen. Chess. Bishop takes queen. Uh, knight takes bishop. Rook takes knight. And now rook, rookie two check. And black wins the bishop on d2. White plays king f1, rook takes d2. Okay, peace in my pocket. Uh, white resigns, black wins. Okay, so all that, all that is not good. When you look at all these moves for white, all these natural moves, they're all getting crushed by something. It just shows it's hard to play a chess game when you've got one piece doing absolutely nothing on a3, and then your king is a bit exposed, and, uh, and you eat healthy. <laughs> okay, so what my friend from Florida did was to protect this pawn, he plays queen h2. All right. Now I play pawn takes pawn. Now I'm looking to get my queen into that e3 square. So Miles first stops this. Well, he first plays rook takes rook check. I play rook takes rook. And now he plays queen takes g3. All right, so white has succeeded in protecting his pawn. He succeeded in deterring black from uh, infiltrating to e3. But now black's got knight f4. The quiet knight on g6 joins the attack, and it's, uh, it's raining down in white's position. The two immediate threats, knight e2 check, forking the king and queen. That's a good move. And then this pawn is now double attacked. So Miles plays king h2, trying to meet both threats. And, and here's how he met his end. I took this pawn anyway. Knight takes h3. Uh, White's next move makes no difference to anything. White checks. Black puts his king in the corner. And now with this knight threatening to move and to attack white's king some more, white took this. And here's how the game ended. Knight g4 check by black. The king does not want to come up and expose itself to more dangers. So the king goes over to g2. Now this, the weakness of this e3 square comes into play. Black plays knight e3 check. Again, white doesn't want to move his king forward and have new problems. No, it's made in one, actually. That's a problem. OK, so king h2 st staying on the defense of the queen. Now the bishop, which hasn't been doing much, now it comes into its own. Bishop e5 check, attacking white's king. White is, again, white does not want to relinquish his queen. So white plays bishop g3, and I took it off. Bishop takes g3 check, and uh, this was the end here. Miles resigned because king takes g3, queen f4 is mate. One, one of my favorite chess quotes at the end of this lecture about combinations. Here's the quote. I probably, I probably read too many chess books to think this is funny, but the quote is, a brilliancy is when you attack your opponent's piece and he can't defend it. 
Now, my translation of this is, what I say in my book is, uh, don't be brilliant, stupid, just play good moves. Uh, combinations are great when they happen, but they're rare. And what will happen over and over in your games is you'll be able to attack the guy's piece and he won't be able to move it. And maybe you won't want to show that in a lecture, but you'll still win the game. Thank you very much. Thank you.